All right, so we are here for the Azure AD for the Azure Data Services. And, and why I chose this topic is because the scope and landscape of Azure Data Services is so vast. If we think about it, we have everything from like the very commonly used Azure SQL, we have Azure Data Lake, we have even Cosmos DB, and now even Synapse Analytics. We have all these different services just for storing data. Plus then on the other hand, we have services that we use for working with that data, like Azure Data Factory. That is something we might use for moving the data around and things like Azure Databricks, which we might use, use to work with that data. And so, unfortunately, the place when we most likely bump into Azure AD is when at some times we cannot access the data that we want to. And the tricky thing with all these services is that they all function a little differently. The authentication mechanisms to each of them are slightly different. So that is that is why it can get a little tricky to grasp kind of the big picture of what fits together with what and how do you actually make this all work. And so I'll be attempting today to make that very clear to you with this subset of data services on Azure. So we're going to be starting today with some Azure AD fundamentals. I'm, I'm kind of assuming that you know the names of Azure Data Services since this is a data conference, but I'm kind of assuming that you don't know so much about Azure AD. Then we're gonna be walking through some Azure AD use cases. And this means that we're gonna be looking at what kind of authentication mechanisms would you need when you're working, for example, with your data platform on Azure? What are the situations where you actually need to do authentication? And lastly, we're going to be doing looking at the full landscape of Azure Data Services and how the Azure AD authentication kind of links into each of these and how it differs between the different services. And we're actually going to also look what are the other options for authentication and why specifically should you be using Azure AD? Why is it better? And so I'm Hey Nilmarinen. I work as a DevOps consultant in at Polar Squad. Polar Squad is a Finnish DevOps company uh, with about 50 people. So I work kind of, I work with both data projects and infrastructure projects, but I work more from the side of how can we make the environment creation and management as easy as possible. I am also a data platform MVP just quite recently and also a certified trainer. So I run some Azure trainings as well. My favorite topic to talk about is architecture and actually Azure AD also fits into this very well uh, because it is one of those aspects that we need to consider no matter what we're working with in Azure. And actually my background is in mathematics. I, I have studied mathematics and then after that I decided to hop over to the IT world and start, start looking at everything here. Oh, sorry, interesting. I noticed my camera isn't working, but somehow it just stopped that while the screen share started. I think it might be the browser version of Teams that's doing that. But I hope you can hang with it. It's going to take too much to hop over to the actual Teams client and get that worked out. Sorry, sorry for that. No problem, uh, but we can hear you fine and see your screen. That's already important. Yes, that is the most important part here. <laughs> I'm just going to make funny facial expressions at myself here then. <laughs> and and lastly, you might notice I'm a bit of a serial doodler. That's that's the style I do my presentations in. And I just wanted to mention before we kind of hop into it in full speed, I'm so happy to get to be part of this first Dataverse event. It is such a unique event in the kind of broad spectrum of events we have there. And it's just a privilege to be part take part here. And I hope I can really encourage, especially those of you who might not have such a long background in the IT or data platform side and are thinking about getting into speaking, just know that everyone has like a good point of view. And if you're thinking about it, just reach out to any of the speakers and everyone is so happy to help always. So know you can get support if you would like that. 
So let's get started with Azure AD fundamentals. So how most companies end up with Azure AD is so that they have started using Office 365. So something like Teams or OneDrive or anything like that. You kind of get Azure AD on the side. You don't necessarily have to manage it a lot or anything like that, but it's it comes as part of the package. And Azure AD is, of course, where all those users that are using your Office 365 products, that's where their identities are held. But just as well, you could get started with Azure AD by starting to use Power BI, because also to use Power BI, you are required to have an Azure AD. And the same applies to Azure as well. So you might start to see some kind of a pattern here. Azure AD is kind of the central identity system for, for all of the Microsoft cloud services. It doesn't matter if you start with Azure, it doesn't matter if you get started with Office 365, you will always have Azure AD on the side. And since today we're specifically talking about Azure, you cannot start using Azure without an Azure AD. So even if you sign up for a free subscription uh, with your even personal account, like a dot live, I mean, at live.com account or anything like that, you actually get this default directory handed to you and automatically created for you when you do that. But more commonly, of course, when we're working in uh, kind of working environments, uh, corporate environments, we have an Azure AD that is for that particular company. So we have a custom domain name for it, for example, company.com or whatever it might be. And all our accounts have that ending to them. But the fact is that the cloud services haven't been around for that long, if we kind of look at the long-term perspective here. And Azure AD has really been created just for these cloud services. So in a lot of cases, what you'll find also is that you have a company that has also another identity service that they're using uh, that is on premises for them. And they might have a regular Active Directory in their own, own local environment and all their accounts get synchronized to Azure AD from there. And that makes it for you as the user so that you don't actually feel like you're using two different accounts or authenticating against two different systems because you have the same account no matter are you using Azure AD or whether you're locally signing in to some kind of service. So it becomes nice and seamless. There is though kind of differences between the traditional Active Directory and Azure Active Directory. And I just want to briefly point this out, just in case you've kind of been more used to working with the regular Active Directory, is that in Active Directory, we're used to having like uh, organizational units and all these hierarchical structures in place. But on the other hand, uh, Azure AD is actually flat. So there is no kind of this hierarchical structure to it. Yes, we can organize our users into groups, and things like that, but it's not the same hierarchical structure that we have within Active Directory. And for a lot of companies, that makes it a little less easy to manage. On the other hand, though, what we get with Azure Active Directory is, of course, that out there in the world, there are other companies that also have Azure ADs in use. Well, they've started using Office 365 or something else. What that enables us to do is that we can invite guests from those other Active Directories to our own Active Directory. And in that way, also be able to use those identities as we work with Azure. Because why we're still talking about Azure AD here is because we are interested about how do we authenticate to these data services in Azure? Meaning, how do we use Azure SQL? How do we use Azure Data Factory? How do we use Data Lake and so forth? That is what we're trying to solve here but it really helps to understand and see this big picture and what the role of Azure AD is. I always draw it as a single separate service because we shouldn't be mixing it with anything else because you can use it in so many ways. And since we're gonna be then moving on to more going into detail into the services in Azure and the different use cases and so forth, before we do that, I kind of want to highlight a boundary here that is really essential to see. And that is the boundary between Azure AD and Azure. 
though we are required to have an Azure AD to be able to start using Azure, to have an Azure, Azure subscription, and to be able to give anyone access to Azure resources or anything like that, their identities have to be in Azure AD. But we need to remember that there is a separation of management between Azure AD and Azure. So even if you have full access to Azure, you don't necessarily can't do anything in Azure AD. You might not be even able to see the users in Azure AD if the settings are set in a specific way. So we need to remember that separation in our mind that even if you have Azure AD admin rights, even global admin rights that allows you to manage even Office 365 things fully, you cannot still manage Azure resources in that case. So really kind of make sure that you separate Azure AD and Azure in your mind so that they are two different kinds of services. Azure AD is for handling identities, whereas Azure is then this platform of many different services can, that we can deploy. But as we're going to get into the next section, we're going to notice that, yes, we can use Azure AD identities for signing into these different services. So to really kind of distinguish what Azure AD is for, within Azure AD, we can have users and groups, which is kind of the most, I think, easy to think because we have experience of that. We, for example, use Teams and so forth. That's when we're, when we're logging in, we're actually using an Azure AD account to do that. But on the other hand, we can also use Azure AD for identities such as application identities. And this is what will actually give us a lot of flexibility with what kind of uh, use cases we can use Azure AD authentication for as we're talking about the data services. And then there's actually a third category, which is devices. But we're not going to, we're kind of going to skip that today <laughs> because it is kind of a whole another world in itself, how to manage devices and everything like that. But I just wanted to kind of give you the idea that. Azure AD is really kind of the hub of all the Microsoft Cloud services, and also that there are a lot of capabilities to it. And today we're mainly going to be looking at the users and applications aspect to it, particularly how it kind of uh, relates to the Azure data services. So just to wrap, wrap this all up, as we kind of said, Azure AD is the central hub for all the Microsoft services. To use any of them, whether it's the Azure resources or anything other than that, you need to have Azure AD. And that is where you can hold your users, uh, application, and device identities. And then we have these additional capabilities, uh, like we can invite guest users. We can also synchronize our local identities to Azure AD as well. So I think this is kind of the minimum that you should be, you should have information about Azure AD to really start to grasp how we then can start using it for, uh, you in use with the Azure data services themselves. So just a reminder: if you have any questions at any point, pop them in the chat. I'll I'll have some moments here to reply to any questions as well. So since we've now covered covered the Azure AD fundamentals, we are now able to move into the Azure AD use cases. I do have to specify this is in terms of how we work with data services and what kind of uh, different levels there are. And I have actually categorized these to two. So the one aspect of this is that we need to create and manage Azure resources. So when we're starting to work with any data services on Azure, the first thing is we need to create some services and then moving forward, we do need to be able to make some configuration changes and so forth. And so the most traditional thing is that you have your user and maybe a group of users and they need to do tasks like creating, configuring, removing uh, any services that you wish to create. And it can either be a single Azure data service that you're doing, for example, an Azure SQL database, or you might be actually building a full on data platform solution and you need to be able to create other services as well. And as we said there, in as we were going through the fundamentals, what we need to have 
when we want to give any kind of management access to users to our Azure resources, that user needs to be in our Azure AD tenant. So we need to be able to find that user in there. And so that user needs to already exist there or they need to be added. If we, for example, have a consultant coming in who needs to do some tasks, we might need to add a user account for that user. And as said, those users can be invited as guest users, or you can create a new user, new user in the Azure AD as well. And remember, sometimes you will find that you do not have access to the Azure AD, but instead you have to reach out to somebody who has full uh, administrative access, who can create users and things like that. You might not necessarily be able to do that. Sometimes you will be able to invite guests, but that's, that also kind of depends on the situation and how the Azure AD configuration settings have been set. And what Azure AD does to this user is when they log in, Azure AD checks, is this user who they are claiming to be? So first of all, Azure AD has to find that user in the tenant, but then it checks with the password, is this the user that they are claiming to be? And a lot of times, at least in Finland, we also have uh, multi-factor authentication enabled. So you either get a text message that you get a verification code in, or you use the authenticator app to approve that sign-in too, so that you have kind of two layers of verification that you actually are who you are. And that MFA capability is built into Azure AD, though it does need to be enabled to really leverage it. But so Azure AD does that portion. It checks, is this user who they are claiming to be? But what determines can that user create and configure an Azure SQL or an Azure Data Factory and so forth? That is the role that it is given. And within Azure, on the management layer, it means what are their Azure RBAC roles, role-based access control. And there are many different roles that you can find in Azure RBAC. And you can even create your custom roles. But just as, as a refresher, there are kind of three main roles. There is the owner, contributor, and the reader. And the owner have, has full, full on access. They can give other users access, role-based access controls. They can create, delete. They can do everything to any Azure resource that they wish. The contributor has full access, except they cannot assign roles to other users. So that's kind of the restriction you have for the contributor. And the last role is the re reader role as well. And so when you're thinking about what kind of Azure RBAC roles to give to users, think about what is the least uh, access that they need. But also <laughs> keep in mind that you don't want to make their life hard either. So give enough permissions, but not too much. And one of the good guidelines is don't have too many owners in your environment, whether it's your single Azure subscription, for example. Make sure there's a few. There should be more than one, but not, not like everyone is given the owner rights right away. And so when we're managing Azure resources, we have, of course, many ways we can do that. We can do it through the portal, but more and more in my work, since I, I work on the DevOps side, I see that this is being done using infrastructure as code. And if you don't know what that means, it means that you are defining your infrastructure in these uh, templates or files that has a specific syntax so that Azure understands what kind of resources it then has to create based on that code. And there are many tools to do that. There's the Bicep by Microsoft, and then there's Terraform and Pulumi and so forth. So many tools. But why I mentioned this is that because this is starting to be a way that people are using more and more. In some cases, you don't actually have a user that is doing the creation and management of Azure resources. Instead, you might have a service that is creating pipelines. So for example, you might be running pipelines in GitHub Actions or GitLab or Azure DevOps or anything like that. It can be any of those services where you can create pipelines and run, run some CLI commands. That's pretty much all you need. And so again, since we're using Azure AD to 
be able to use Azure RBAC, that service identity needs to be found in Azure AD. But how do we get there? How do we get the service identity into Azure AD? Since if we have something like GitHub or GitLab, that is something completely outside of Azure that we're referencing. How do we get an identity for that service? So here we get to the concept of an app registration. So in Azure AD, you can register applications. They can be uh, services that you run on uh, actual servers. They can be software as a service services, and there's kind of ready-made registration um, guidelines for those. They can be a custom application that you're building in Azure. It can be anything. But let's stick to the use case we were talking about here. So we have a service that we are using to build our environment and manage our infrastructure. So with the app registration, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be telling what is the name of this service. And then we're also going to be defining scopes, what can it do, and so forth. And what happens when we create an app registration? We get a application object in the Azure AD. This is uh, globally unique. So you cannot find the same application object in any Azure AD. But then you also find a service principle. And this is where it can often get a little confusing because the term service principle is used in so many places. And it can be a little confusing. What is the difference between an application object and service principle? So the service principle is created based on the application object. And some, sometimes there's really no difference. But if you had like a multi-tenant application, then you would have multiple service principles in different Azure ADs representing that one application. But unfortunately, even though that would be really interesting to talk about, that is kind of out of the scope of this session. We don't have enough time to get into that, into that discussion. But the essential part here is that when you do that app registration, you get an application ID or a client ID in some cases, how it might be also called in your Azure AD. And after that, when you're creating your Azure RBAC role and giving it, you will find that application registration with that app ID. And you can give an owner role to it just as you would give to any other regular user. So after that, it works just like a regular user, which is really neat. It's just an application identity. So the other layer where we need to use Azure AD for authentication is, of course, when we work with data. The management side is still kind of mandatory. You need to get the infrastructure up and running before you can start working with the data. So this is where, where it starts to get interesting. And we actually get to get our hands dirty. And we need to log in. We need to get be able to read some data and so forth. How do we get there and how do we use Azure AD for that? So I'm going to use Azure SQL as an example because it's kind of a one of a kind in terms of authentication. So it's a little different than the other data services. And so again, we have start with just a regular user that we want to be able to sign in and then work with the data. So in this case, it's, for example, they need to read some data, they need to write some data, they just need to be able to run queries there, select star from, and so forth, whatever that might be. And if you remember, when you create an Azure SQL database, it asks you for an admin credentials when you're doing that. And what those credentials are is that it's a SQL admin and that it is using SQL authentication. But after you have created your Azure SQL, you can find a place in the portal that looks like this, that says Azure Active Directory. And this allows you to set an Azure Active Directory administrator for your SQL database. And after that, you are able to add additional users there. So what you just need to do is enable Azure AD authentication. And after that, you are able to add users to any roles that you would with just regular SQL authentication, you just reference this um, external identity provider uh, when you're 
creating the users and so forth and giving them roles within the SQL itself. So you just enable that, you have the admin account, the Azure AD admin account to be exact, and then you're able to add other Azure AD users. And now since we're using Azure AD again, we're getting back to the same point as previously. We again need to find those users in our Azure AD. They need to be there for us to be able to use Azure AD authentication. And the neat thing here is that if you're using Azure AD authentication for Azure SQL, even though you are going into the actual database and working with the data, when the user is signing in, it again gets authenticated against Azure AD. So checked, is this person the person that they're pretending to be? And if you have, uh, again, multi-factor authentication enabled, for example, it will again ask that user for that double verification. So whatever you have configured within your Azure AD, those policies will apply whenever users are authenticating with it. So it doesn't matter whether they're authenticating to Azure SQL or to the Azure portal or whatever the place might be. And then the only difference here is that we're referencing the Azure AD identities. Uh, we are still using the roles that are available within SQL itself and giving those roles, assigning those roles in the Azure SQL itself as well. But kind of as we had with the first use case, uh, we also might have cases where we have an application that is reading and writing the data. So it can be any service, a custom application, um, our application that needs to use that Azure SQL data, it doesn't matter. It can be any service whatsoever. And there we just need to go through the app registration steps again that I showed in the previous use case as well. So same mechanism, nothing different in this case. But there's another scenario here that we might want to consider, which is that sometimes we actually might be using another Azure service to read data from for example, from our Azure SQL. So what happens then? For example, we might be uh, using Azure Data Factory to copy data from Azure SQL to a data lake or some other destination. And now the issue is, well, I don't think we have an identity for Azure Data Factory, or if we do, what? What is the identity? How do we find out what the identity is? There is the possibility for you to just put an individual user's credentials in to log into or verify that you can access that Azure SQL when you're defining everything in Azure Data Factory. But of course, it would be better if we have an identity that is of that service itself of Azure Data Factory. And what comes in at this point is that we have this capability of defining managed identities for services in Azure. So Azure Data Factory is one of those that you can define a managed identity for. Uh, there are also other services like Azure Machine Learning, um, virtual machines, and so forth. But I have to say the services that are more used for storing data, like Azure SQL and Data Lake, for those, you cannot uh, define a managed identity because it makes no sense. They're not going to call another service because they are normally the ones that get called for data. So they're not going to be trying to access some other service in, in themselves. So it is more the services that are likely to try to access another service. When you create an Azure Data Factory uh, in the Azure portal, there is actually an identity that gets created for it by default, and that is called a system assigned identity. So it means that as long as you have that specific Azure Data Factory, that identity will exist. But if you delete the Azure Data Factory, then that identity will also get deleted. And behind the scenes, what happens? It is actually making that app registration in Azure AD for you. And then also the Azure data, it is tied to the lifetime of the Azure Data Factory itself. Just recently, there has 
become a preview where you can also link a system assigned managed, uh, uh, sorry, user assigned Azure managed identity for the Azure Data Factory. So you have system assigned or user assigned. And with a user assigned managed identity, you create the app registration beforehand, and then you link that to the specific service where you want to use it. But that's still in preview. So currently kind of the more common way is to use the system assigned managed identity for Azure Data Factory. So then as long as we have that identity, then we are able to again assign access for that specific identity. We just need to know the app ID, application ID for that. So we are able to leverage that. So as a recap, we kind of went through these two different layers of, of uh, how we might be working with our data platform. There is the just managing the infrastructure itself where we are more using Azure RBAC. And then there is the layer of where we are actually going into a specific service and working with the data itself. And in this particular example, we looked at Azure SQL, but as we are moving on to the next section in there, we're gonna be looking more at, well, how do all these different services work? Because the authentication mechanisms are a little different depending on which ones of the services we are using. So this was specific to Azure SQL in this case. But kind of the flows of where you need to have this calling parties identity, you always need to have it in Azure AD, and then you just assign the appropriate um, roles to it, whatever, with the method that is relevant to that specific service. So we've managed to get through some of the Azure AD fundamentals. We've looked at the use cases, how, in what, what ways might you need the uh, Azure AD authentication and so forth. And lastly, we're kind of gonna be looking at the big picture. How, what are all the services? What are the differences for authentication? What are the similarities? And kind of get this big picture for it. How does it all differ and so forth. And at this point, actually, we're going to just look at the access to data layer because on the management side, it is all the same, whatever services you're working with. So the first use case we walked over, that will be the same no matter what the service is. But on the other hand, uh, we are going to be looking at how does the data access differ based, based on the service that we're using. So we are going to be looking at how Azure AD fits with all the Azure data services. And we're kind of going to be making this full on map. And since we just talked about Azure SQL, let's just recap that. So we have the options of using SQL authentication. And that is how Azure SQL works out of the box. And that is where you then have to create your users and logins within, within your Azure SQL itself and then assign them the appropriate roles that are needed. But on the other hand, we can also use the Azure AD authentication. And that is then where you can just reference the identities that exist within your Azure Active Directory already at this point. And you don't need to create any new identities within Azure SQL, but Azure SQL will use Azure AD for the authentication mechanism. So that's pretty straightforward. We still use the same roles. We don't use any different kind of roles. And that makes sense because Azure SQL is based on the regular SQL server. It has evolved from that. It wasn't just created directly into Azure as a completely new service. So it, of course, uses the same authentication mechanisms that were in place even before Azure. Now it's just able to leverage Azure AD for the authentication part and use your, those identities. But on the other hand, for example, a service like Azure Data Lake, it hasn't existing before. It is brand new and has come along with Azure coming along. And in the beginning, actually, the only way that you could use Azure AD identities for authentication was for that management layer. And instead, there were other methods of authenticating to these services. And for Azure Data Lake, 
for example, or Azure storage. Data Lake is just with the hierarchical namespace enabled for the storage. So one method is using the access keys, but you don't actually want to do that because the access keys give you full access to the entire storage account. No restrictions, nothing. You just have access to everything. There then was another method called shared access signatures, which does give more restrictions. You can create a shared access signature to a specific file. Uh, you can give only read access with it. So you can define what kind of access needs to be given. It doesn't have to be full access or anything like that. But then after you have the shared access signature, anyone who gets their hands on that shared access signature can then use it and use it to do whatever those uh, that signature gives access to. So a lot of times then these shared access signatures are made for a short time span so that there's kind of no uh, infinite uh, kind of scope that the storage account is compromised, but you just create it for the amount of the time that you use it for. And if you're an application developer, there are SDKs that you can use to create these shared access signatures and manage them and renew them and so forth. But then, then comes the issue that, well, what if it is more like users that are doing them? What about now that Azure Data Lake is kind of part of also the Synapse Analytics, the entirety of it? You need to have an Azure Data Lake. How do you uh, define those access controls in place? And the neat thing with Azure Data Lake is that there is now the possibility to give Azure RBAC um, define Azure RBAC on the Azure Data Lake itself. So there is actually, um, there are actually RBAC roles that are on the data layer. So there is, I thought I grabbed a screenshot for you guys, but <laughs> realized I didn't. But there are these Azure storage uh, blob reader, for example. So there are different roles that enable the user to uh, for example, just read certain things in the storage account. And then you can, of course, uh, restrict that by choosing the correct scope. Is it uh, like read everything in the entire storage account or just read a specific folder or what? what is the extent of and scope where that access needs to be given? But with Azure RBAC, you define it the same way as any other Azure RBAC roles. You go to the correct scope, and then you just choose the identity that needs to be given that access. And again, it can be either a service or an individual. Either way works. Then we kind of get to some other Azure, Azure data services. I decided to pick out uh, Cosmos DB here because uh, it's interesting. <laughs> it, it is kind of this weird database that contains many different APIs or database structures that you can use, use for your data. And with Cosmos DB, there is kind of some similarities with Azure storage, in my opinion, even though they are named differently. But within Cosmos DB, again, it's not long ago you could not use Azure AD authentication in any way. There was no way to do that. And what we had in place at that point was that we had these things called primary keys. And you had a primary, primary key that you could use for read and write or just read. So you had kind of two options. But again, we kind of run into the issue that it is to the entire Cosmos DB account. Uh, it is kind of a wide, wide access in my opinion, and you shouldn't be using it again. There was another option in place and still is actually, which is resource tokens. And this again is kind of similar to the shared access signatures. They're not created in the same way or anything like that. But in the mentality, you are specifying more granularly which, uh, for example, collection do you need to get access to and what kind of access do you need? So it is the similar idea as with the shared access signatures on the Azure storage side. But and with this one, again, it has been relatively easy and okay to manage with uh, programmatically. 
But if you would have wanted this to be based on any kind of identities, it would have been a lot, lot harder to do. So the third option now that has actually come around very, very recently is that there is this option of using Cosmos DB RBAC. And note that it doesn't say Azure RBAC. That means that you cannot go into the same place as you go with Azure RBAC and you define it there. You cannot also um, define it with, for example, the same Azure CLI commands if that's your favorite tool to use for, for managing <laughs> infrastructure. So really, this is kind of a cos RBAC system that is built within Cosmos itself. But the nice thing here is that, again, you get to use your Azure, Azure AD identities. And it doesn't matter whether it's an individual user or whether it's a service. And I actually have been gotten the chance to use this RBAC in my previous or latest project at work. And it's kind of cool because it, this used to be really, really hard. And so with the Cosmos RBAC, the thing that is still in place, you can only do this uh, programmatically. So there's no uh, user interface yet in place for this. Uh, there is a specific set of commands that you can, for example, find from Azure Clay to define these. But you are able to define these and you're able to go very granular with how you want to give the roles. And there are some built-in roles, and then you can define any custom roles that you might need and go very specific with your scenario. What are your collections and databases and so forth? And what level do you want that access to go to? Then we had in our first picture, we also had Azure Data Factory in it. And also we had Azure Databricks. And we're not going to go into the details with these ones today, but um, I actually realized that I wrote this wrong. So for Azure Data Factory, you can use managed identity, but for Azure Databricks, you're not, uh, it's not possible to configure a managed identity at this point. So what you would do with Azure Databricks is that you would treat it as any other service calling a data service. So for example, if you would want to read your data in Azure Data Lake from Azure Databricks, you would go into Azure AD and create an app registration for the Azure Databricks. So you have a service principle for it. And then you would assign the appropriate Azure RBAC roles to that identity in your Azure storage account. So even though it's not a managed identity, you still have that service principle creation that you do to have an identity in the Azure AD for for the Databricks itself as well. Then as the last piece here, we had Azure Synapse Analytics, which gets a little tricky. And again, we're not going to go into every exact detail at this point because we're kind of coming to the end of the time here. And I'm going to leave just a little time for questions in the end. But think about it this way. So within Azure Synapse Analytics, we have the dedicated SQL pools portion, which is the old Azure Data Warehouse. So that, that is in the flavor category with Azure SQL. It is, it, it is kind of has those same flavors in regard to authentication. So for that, we have the same options as we have with Azure SQL. With, if you look at the whole pl plate of Azure Synapse Analytics that includes the dedicated SQL pools, uh, the data lake, the pipelines, Etc. It has all those different components that come together to give all those capabilities. Then if you need somebody to be able to read data from your Azure Data Lake storage and run SQL queries on it uh, with, uh, with the on-demand SQL pool, then you need to have the correct Azure RBAC roles for that user in the Azure Data Lake. So when in regards to Azure Synapse Analytics, really think about it in terms of the different components that make up the Azure Synapse Analytics. And then there's a whole other layer of the workspace side. But if you're more interested in that, I've done a session on the Azure Synapse Analytics. I think you can find it somewhere and 
you can't go poke, poke around because there I went more into detail how you do the uh, access control in Azure Synapse Analytics. So as you can see, we have many services. We didn't even go through like every single uh, option that you could use from Azure for any kind of data solution. But here is kind of a good, good overview of some of the most commonly used services that at least I have been using and I have heard other people use. And as you can see, we have options. We have different options, how we can configure things and how we can configure authentication to uh, control who can do what with our data. And as I said, in the beginning, it used to be so that you only used Azure AD to authenticate and determine how you can manage these Azure resources, not actually how you can get into the data. But as I said, more and more of these features have been coming up where we are getting, for example, Cosmos DB are back and so forth. They are giving us more capabilities and possibilities to use those Azure AD identities. And it is driving us more towards also ensuring that each of the services that call our data, data stores, they need to have their own identity as well. So, but the question stands, why would you use Azure AD instead of, for example, SQL authentication or, well, I'm not gonna say primary keys or anything like that, but the other, other authentication other authentication methods that are available. Why would you do that? Well, I think there are kind of two main benefits. And the first one is that each of the users and applications that are calling your database, they have their own identities. So that means that in terms of, for example, auditing and having granular access, uh, granular control over who accesses what data, it is much more easy because each of the users has their own identity. And on the auditing side, you can always tell which user has been able to read what data and which user or application has done a specific task. So it really enables that you have kind of that um, synchronicity. You don't have to be multi have multiple accounts for one user. If your user is already in Azure AD, you don't have to have a separate SQL user for them, or they do not need to have a SAS token created for them to read from the storage account. So it's just simpler. There's no overlap, there's no duplication, there's nothing like that in place. So it's just more straightforward and clean and more secure in that way as well. The other aspect there is that you can use all the Azure AD capabilities that are in place. That means that for your users, if you have MFA, multi-factor authentication enabled, it means no matter what Azure storage solution they're signing into, they need to fulfill their MFA requirements. They cannot hop in from anywhere. They need to fulfill that. And any other policies that you might have in place in Azure AD, those need to be fulfilled before a user can sign in. So since the authentication is being done through Azure AD to check is this user the user that they are pretending to be or claiming to be, then it means that they really get uh, checked against all the re requirements that are configured in Azure AD as well. So this is really why you should also care about Azure AD because it is the central component of all the Microsoft services. And even if you're working with data, you cannot avoid working with users and applications that read that data. So it is, it is like a good to get inspired to learn a little more about Azure AD and get on track how to use uh, the service principles for your applications and the different methods in which you can assign access to users in different services. So here we have now in the last a little over 50 minutes, we've walked through the Azure AD fundamentals. So I think we kind of covered the bare minimum that you need to know about Azure AD. Know that there is a whole lot more to learn if you got excited and want to learn more. Uh, I encourage you to go kind of through the use cases where you need it and start figuring more things out from that perspective.
Then we walk through some Azure AD use cases, meaning kind of what are the ways in which you need different levels of access? And the two main levels are the having the right access to be able to create and manage your Azure resources. And the other layer is um, just getting access to the data itself. And then in this last portion, we want, went through all the different options of authenticating into the data layer itself. How do you do that? And what are the differences between the different services? And as you could see, it was kind of like, no service has exactly the same method. <laughs> so the Azure storage uses the Azure RBAC, uh, the Cosmos DB has the Cosmos DB RBAC, and then in Azure SQL, it uses the roles from within SQL, but you can reference the Azure AD identities and so forth. So the methods vary. So you do need to go poking around and testing these different methods out to get a full grasp of it. But now you have kind of an overview of how they fit together. So thank you so much for joining. I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new and learned something that you can take into your next projects. And I am hoping that maybe there are some questions out there that you would like to clarify. For example, if you want to ask about uh, a specific service or anything like that, or just Azure AD seems confusing, just it actually is a little confusing. <laughs> so I'm not surprised if that happens. Let me know if you need any clarification on anything.